Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm Megan, I'm your Vice President of Welfare and Community, and we have Jakey here as well, um, who was, is an alumni of Bath Spa, and yeah, do you want to... <laughs> <laughs> and, um, hi, yeah, I'm Jake, and yeah, let's, I'm ready to get into it as soon as you are, Meg. Yeah, so, um, in this talk, Kalichi will explore the angry black woman narrative and why okay. it's great to be handled by reclaiming anger. While there are people who are fearful of the anger that has led people onto the streets to protest and welcome, and she welcomes it. For centuries, black people have been stereotyped by society as angry, leaving little room for um, them to truly be honest about why all of all our objectives, angry was one that was placed upon us. The anger we are seeing today is a valid expression of hurt that is re resoluted from centuries of slavery, colonization, and sim systematic in institutional oppression. In 2020, it took the UK government's handling of a pandemic plus another case of police brutality to get us all to decide that enough is enough. Um, yeah, that's from uh, British Radio 2020, that Kalichi said. Um, so we're going to have a 60 minute discussion um, and we've got some questions. If any of you do have questions, please again feel free to turn off your camera or put them in the chat. Um, and yeah, we'll get started. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, thank you for introducing me, Megan. Um, as mentioned, my name is Kalechi Okafor and I write, I act, direct, and I've got a podcast officially called Say Your Mind. And um, yeah, it, I just got it. It's an iPod studio the dance fit. And all of them are important to me because they're an expression of my black womanhood and because blackness and womanhood it means that we can all show up um, in the ways that we want to show up and it was just it's really really important for me to make sure that I'm showing up as truthfully as I can and with my experiences as well. So I thought that the best place to start, really, I'm not the kind of person that really enjoys like talking at people. I think that the way that we learn that um, organic, that's, that's momentum and vitality is if we have a discussion. So I've opened on my screen right now, I've got the chat uh, functionality open. So if, as we're talking, if you want to start writing in there as well, you can, you know, you can, if questions are coming up as we go. Um, angry black woman. Ooh, aggressive. Black women are so aggressive. They're so angry. Oh my God, don't attack me. Black women and anger. It's an interesting subject to me and it's one that I focused so much on um, over the past couple of years, I'd say specifically, because I've realized that some of the reasons that people would shy away from me is because they would say often, oh, she's so angry. Why is she so angry? Um, in fact, one of the episodes that I put out of the podcast today, somebody wrote in and they said, oh, you know, whenever I'm listening to you, my mum is in the background saying, oh, is that your friend being angry again? And at first I thought, you know, you know, when people say things like that, that, oh, you know, everyone's, you know, afraid of it. They don't like it. What I came to understand is that people are scared of anger and they're scared of black women's anger. Like, why are you scared of black women being angry? First of all, you haven't actually seen um, black, wom um, black women being angry because they haven't been afforded the space to show that anger. But that's the function. That's the very real function of labeling black women angry already so they never have access to that so they actually they run the other way um, from showing their anger and they try to do as much as they can to be subservient to the system that oppresses them and so it's a mind game it's a psychological game that's being played and I welcome the anger I welcome feeling all of the anger because any um I feel like psychologists worth their salt will tell you that anger is a surface emotion that um, the, the underlying feelings are usually sadness, are usually pain, are usually hurt. Why are black women hurt? Why are they, you know, why are they in pain? These are the things that we need to tell the truth about in order that we understand the anger. But first, the anger has to, you know, the anger has to take place. So I started thinking to myself, well, what we want to do first is go back to where this, um, narrative started for black people generally because we know that that is the basis also of um, police brutality across the world that you know black people are these um uncivilized um you know untamable um 
angry beasts. We heard the narrative that was given to us about Trayvon Martin when he was shot um, numerous times. We're told that, oh, I kept shooting him because he kept getting bigger. He kept getting bigger. Who gets bigger at being shot is the way that blackness is dehumanized. But that doesn't come by chance. It isn't by chance that we ended up here. Something happened something took place to drive this narrative forward so i started doing my research and i found out that um during the 18th century was the period where europe began this kind of period of uh, called the enlightenment movement which is also why i shy away from the word now when we talk about enlightenment because of the way i feel that it's just been like bastardized um when it's used in um in the modern day when we ignore how it the violence that that caused for black people so a lo lots of white men lots of white scientists philosophers um decided that they were going to do away and not think about religion or superstition like they were scholars that wanted to you know explore scientific means um as to how we compartmentalize and categorize and name and label the things in our society so Scandinavian born Carolus Linnaeus um, has a piece of work called Systema Nature that was written in 1735. So that was the first kind of one of the first pieces of documentation that we find where we see a classification of race based on skin color. Because actually, when we look at the um, when we look at the, I, I would say kind of the genetic differences between ourselves that people use as the justification for race. It's so minute that it makes no sense. It's so minute that we can disregard it. So we're not focusing on um, that. What, we, what we're trying to focus on is the ideological aspects that have been added and attached to the concept of race. So Carolus Linnaeus, in all of his waywardness and madness, decided that, you know, um, there, were good, there were two different races that we were gonna focus on. So we have Homo Europaeus, um, who is of fair complexion, lovely temperament, becoming form, and gentle manners, and acute in judgment. And they are governed by fixed laws, right? And then we've got the um, homo afa, which would be the black person, the African, that was deemed to be of a black complexion, um, phlegmatic in temperament, crafty, indolent, and governed by their actions, and they're uh, governed in their actions by just impulse. So this narrative became one that stuck, and people were just like, you know what? Maybe Carolus is making points, maybe Carolus is spitting facts even though it's just pseudoscience even that, that's entrenched in um eugenics and and white supremacy right so he's come up with these two concepts and these two concepts have not left us even till today and we see it played out um for us in how again black people are viewed um as uncivilized can't tame you know they're impulsive and they're thieves because that's also what's being told to us here that they're thieves although they've never stolen a, stolen a continent or people but but given, given all of these narratives and um, whiteness in comparison to that, the Homo Europaeus doesn't do any of these things. They are so intelligent, so so logical and, and just of great temperament yet we find that when we look at all of the wars that have been waged around the world the, this same group of people are involved in it so that narrative got to kind of like play itself out um throughout the centuries and i believe that that gave us then the basis for col um, col uh, colonization and the transatlantic slave trade so people often talk about oh well you know um, I've heard West Africans specifically talk about the fact that, you know, I didn't realize that I was black until I left Africa, or I left West Africa, you know, and I went to Europe or I went to America. That's when I realized that I was black because blackness seems to be a thing that people discovered there. And I understand that narrative and I um, empathize with that narrative. However, I always counter that to say the blackness happened before, the racism happened before the slavery. Racism was the reason that slavery, transatlantic slave, uh, the transatlantic slave trade and colonization happened because there was the justification that these people are less than 
we are so we can go over there and we can take what we want and nobody can tell us a damn thing because they aren't even really human in the way that we are human and so when we talk about humanity we know that um researcher jay bentel um wonderfully said that humanity is a white supremacist construct in and of itself because who gets to decide who is deserving of humanity and who isn't usually white people and so therefore that is um the idea of humanity is something that people are let in and out of and that's what makes it problematic and we see it with um the migrants who uh, are trying to flee the um situations in their countries that i'm sure that this country is also involved in in some ways and we're watching them on national tv um in these rubber um boats and you know they're being interviewed over the rubber boats and just being left out there they're, they're being left out there because they are what not deserving of humanity so we needed a basis to justify why um, one could leave their country, go to another country, take people in their millions, um, some, so many would die along the way, and then enslave them and then help make them build an entirely new country, numerous um, new countries, and f help with the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution would not have happened without slavery, yet this is something that's missed out of um, the conversations that we have and so then we have to look at how black women's roles within that were instrumental black women had to give birth literally to the children that would be enslaved and to keep this whole industry going uh, stella dadsey has a new book coming out called um a kick in the belly where she describes one of the um slave owners who visited jamaica i think it was and he said oh you know um he saw a, a, a black woman being kicked in her belly and he said to him he looks like black women are just kicked in the belly from one end of this island to the other end of this island and literally that has been an experience i think so many black women can speak to so who, who wouldn't be angry about that who wouldn't be angry about the fact that four centuries um, the black woman's body has been a site of um, colonization, experimentation, and just general violence. Yet it's this same body that so many want to emulate in this day and age, um, in terms of aesthetically, while still not giving credit to that, while still denigrating these very same features on black women, the um, creative pursuits that black women bring to the table, uh, whether it's in terms of dance or music or anything of that um, manner, is only profitable and is only embraced when it's brought into the mainstream, I guess, when it's whitewashed. So there are numerous aspects to me, various aspects that we need to examine when we think about the way that um, black women have been treated throughout the centuries and why they would then be angry. But most black women will tell you that they're not angry because they're feeling joy and they're feeling all of the things and I support this they should feel um they should feel all of these things black women should have access to all of these things but i think that they should also have access to anger too because anger also has a place in all of this there is a reason to be angry in the modern day we look at the speculum you know with, uh, and this is talked about in medical apartheid we look at the speculum um created by james marion sims and we talk about what a great invention it is great innovation that you can use the speculum to kind of you know open the um vagina when you're doing medical examinations but those innovations for uh, that were created by james marion sims were tested out initially on enslaved black women who often he would not give um, you know anesthesia to probably never at all he wouldn't give anesthesia to so black women's bodies have had to suffer for the sake of science we know that from Henrietta Lacks and um, her um, cells being used to come up with um, vaccines for various diseases but her family didn't even know that John Hopkins was using her cells in that way uh, Sarah Bartman also known as Venus Hottentot that was taken from her country in southern Africa and taken across Europe par paraded around Europe where people could look at her um, her body shape her bum view her labia and all of that um, and even when she died sadly her skeleton and I think parts of her um, genitalia were on show in France for an embarrassingly long time so when will the respect come for black women's bodies because I haven't seen it arrive yet i know that in i've i talk about my um experience of childbirth and prior to that pregnancy loss 
and the way that I was treated in the um, hospital or at the hospital on those two separate occasions the idea that I was not listened to even when I was saying that I was in pain. Why is it not believable that black women could feel pain? So this is why the strong black woman narrative, while it works in some aspects, it also imprisons black women in another aspect. Because the strong that's been talked about is an unfeeling type of strong. It's one that we don't get to explore vulnerability. We don't get to explore perceived weakness because we must always be available um, to produce in whichever way um, is desired. And the fact that black women are five times more likely to die during childbirth in comparison to white women has a lot of people stumped. A lot of people are sitting around saying, well, you know, why could that be? How could that be? Oh, I'm so shocked. This is unbelievable. And I think that we want to be careful when we use language like that, when we talk about things being unbelievable, or I just can't believe this. You better believe it. It's a fact. It's a reality. When we talk about it not being believable or unbelievable, we're moving it to the space of myth. And this is a lived reality for so many black women. The reason that we are finding that black women in comparison to white women are five times more likely to die during childbirth and soon after is because of that myth of angry black women. It's because black women are believed to be unfeeling. So there is an urgency for us to unlearn um, the narratives that kind of permeate our society about black women in order that if we're talking about true allyship in order that black women might live this is the reason that we need to unlearn that we see it playing out with diane abbott diane abbott um gets disproportionately more um abuse in comparison to all the other female MPs combined, you know, when they did the research and they covered a specific um, time during the elections. And everybody kind of sat back and went, oh, isn't that terrible? Oh, isn't that terrible? People saying mean things about Diane Abbott. But it's more than that. We have to think of the mental health of the person. We've got to think of the safety of the person. And why is it okay that people can direct such a vitriol at one black woman that hasn't done anything really to them and other female MPs namely white MPs, um, are complicit in this happening, yet we stay almost quiet, like very, very quiet about it, as if it's the, um, it's the duty, it's the right of passage for every black woman to endure vitriol and continue smiling anyway. And this is why we see the, um, the kind of public embrace of Patrick Hutchinson and, and his carrying of the you know the white racist counter protester as people like to call him the white racist guy during the black lives matter protests people love that image because to them that is how blackness should operate to be ready and available always to carry whiteness even um in the face of our detriment like that should be something that we all think about and again that strong narrative coming through he's not feeling angry patrick instead he's rising above the anger he's rising above all of the disrespect and he's willing to save this white person anyway and i think there comes a point where we have to be honest and say white people should save themselves and um, black people should be afforded the space to feel all of the anger of centuries of injustice um, and you know vilification and denigration and oppression and move towards joy so i will pause it there because i feel like that was very long and um, see where the conversation is going. Uh, thank you so much for that. That was, um, yeah, that was re really truthful to listen to. And I think, you know, a lot of people need to hear that. So thank you. Um, I guess people want to type away questions at all, and we're happy to read them out. Um, mm -hmm. We've also got Natasha with us as well, um, who's going to be helping ask questions. Um, she's a organizer of All Black Lives Matter with the protests going on around the country. So, yeah, she's uh, definitely one to listen to. Um, but I'll ask the first question if that's all right. And um, oh. we'll type away below. Um, so, one of the things that um, is constantly seen across the West and particularly in the universities that I've noticed is the um, expectation that black people should diminish what. Um, like diminish their blackness, uh, what message would you give to people, but especially to young black women who are made to feel like they have to conform or shrink themselves to a white space? It's a difficult one. And I think that that's a, an amazing question, Jake, because 
we are, by the metrics of intelligence in the societies that we exist within um, has its basis in white supremacist patriarchy, right? We have to, you know, for people to know that we're intelligent, for people to know that we're learned, we have to have these um, university degrees and, you know, we have to have all of these accolades and to prove all of that, like we need those metrics. But the thing is, when we enter into these institutions, the things that we are being taught are things focused on whiteness and whiteness being the norm. We're not even asked to um, critically think. We're not being asked to explore um, other manners and to think in the abstract. We are only there to absorb. Um, I feel like in some ways I'd call it indoctrination. When we go into our tests, and um, you know, I was in, at university years ago. I graduated in 2008. So one of the main things that I noticed that I found rather frustrating was that I was just there to regurgitate what I've been told. And if I, you know, um, deviate from that, then I'm going to fail. Then I'm going to get a low score because what I need to do is tell you what you have told me. So where is the learning taking place? Where are we actually learning um, as opposed to just, you know, regurgitating what we've been told. So I think that it's a frustration for a lot of black people who enter into these spaces, who enter into like institutions and various work organizations even. And they think, how can I be me here when I know that everything around me culturally is telling me that me is not allowed, that I'm only allowed in this space as long as I conform to what I'm being told and, and to the kind of general um, agreed manner of behavior. This is why people end up in tribunals. This is why people, I mean, I remember in university, I got um, first year, I'd never been to Liverpool before, but it was the only place that was doing combined degree in drama and the uh, drama and theater studies with law. So that's what I studied. Um, so I travel up to Liverpool with my bags and everything and I move into dorms and I'm living only black girl living with like five white girls and they wanted to do movie night. They wanted to do all of these things together all of the time. I'm not used to that because I wasn't rolling with um, white girls really when I grew up in Peckham. So to me, it was just, and also culturally, I just, it wasn't me. And as an individual, me as my personality, I'm very introverted. So I like to have my own space. Um, I, I'm social on the internet because I don't have to actually be with people. I can say what I want and then turn my phone off. So being in that sort of environment was very exhausting for me. So I found myself kind of like moving away from them when they wanted like their three times a week movie night and everything else. Lo and behold, the, after a couple of weeks of me doing this, I was called by the dean of the school, of the um, university for a meeting and um, was told that the um, girls had decided that they felt threatened by me living in the same dorms as them to the point that they had to all sleep in the same room because they were just so scared of me and that they um, looked up Peckham and they saw the crime rates there and it just made them very, very nervous to be in the same um, dorm as me. Um, and I look back on that experience and I know that it's one of my motivators um, and one of my motivations for doing the things that I do now, because I do not want another black student to be in the space that I was in and think themselves mad and think themselves the problem. Because I just thought, I just come in and out of this flat um, and I don't really say much. So how is it that we've gotten to the point where you're so scared of me that you all have to sleep in one room? I don't even really talk to you like that. And when I remember uh, telling my mum that, because what happened thereafter is that the dean finished the statement and he said so for that reason we're going to move you out of dorms you have to go back to london and we'll try to find you um a new dorm to move into but you know i can't promise anything and i was distraught so i had to go back to london a few weeks after starting university um while they found me a new space because these white girls had said that they were so threatened by me being there and you know being from peckham or whatever um and i remember my mom saying to me so there's five of them there's one of you they couldn't carry you and go and dump you in the bin somewhere. They couldn't, they couldn't, they, you were just so powerful that you one was such a threat to them five. And when my mum broke it down like that, I started to realize that I needed to find the vocabulary and quick 
for what was happening because what was happening was not fair. They cried and their tears got them what they wanted, which was me out of the space. So eventually I was, um, I, they found me um, a room with the PGCE uh, students, the third year students. So I had to, as a first year, not knowing Liverpool, not knowing anything, had to move from first year um, dorms, like interacting with all of those people and move and live with the third years. Thankfully, they were minding their business. They didn't want to talk either because they were just there to kind of do their, you know, things and, and go. So I loved that. But I just hated that I had to go through that traumatic experience to get there. And I bring up that story because that should have shrunk me. That should have made me want to be smaller because the violence in that situation, the unnamed violence in that situation was simply too much. And especially it was too much because I didn't at that point have the words for what was happening. I just knew that it was unfair. So I decided that rather than shrinking, I just had to become bigger and I had to learn very, very quickly how I was going to survive in Liverpool without family, without anyone. And I'm at uni and I've just got to make the most of it. By the time I left university, by the time I finished university, I can hand on heart saying that I was running a lot of things in Liverpool, but I needed to, but that's the kind of spirit that I have. That if you try to bring me down, I will take everything down with me. So but by the end, you know, everyone knew me and they knew me in the best way, but they also knew that, you know, I kind of, I worked with that. If you're going to tell everybody that I'm this bully, that somehow I'm this monster, that you're so scared that you'll have to sleep in one room, then that's what we're going to roll with. That's what I'm going to be. And all of you will get in line. And, you know, it, it worked for me and I left with good grades. I say that to say sometimes we have to lean into um, the opposite narrative, going into spaces and wanting to shrink ourselves. No, be more of ourselves because... We, for so long we've had to learn a lot about white culture because that is the dominant culture globally globally it is we've had to learn so much yet a lot of white people don't tend to know a lot about other cultures because that the overriding the overarching narrative is always one of whiteness so let's do a crash course if you have me in your space you're going to have to learn today that this is just the way it is and that is scary, but this pandemic has shown us that if nothing else, a lot of the structures that we see in place are illusions. And the only way we're going to be able to break away from those illusions is to say literally to the illusion, this is a lie. I know it's a lie, so I'm going to live my truth. That was, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, well, wow, thank you. Yeah, great to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, Ash, do you have a... Do you, uh, does anyone else have a question uh, at all they so, want to carry on with? Um, I just want to say thank you, obviously. As another black woman, I went, obviously went to uni in Bath as well, so I kind of know what it's like to feel like you're shrinking yourself, but like kind of the same thing happened. Like if I go into Bath now, then everybody knows that it's Kasha. But Can I she speak a bit ask, louder, um, please? Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to ask, um, when did you start to feel comfortable in being able to show your, your full emotion to like, to the full extent, like the full extent of your emotions before, like, how did it, like, what kind of age did you get to where you kind of thought like, I'm allowed to feel these emotions and I'm very much able to have these emotions and I'm not going to let anybody um, waver on that. I think it's an ongoing process. I think that there are some emotions that I'm yet to even feel because I think that for emotions to come to the fore, we have to have safe spaces to feel them. And the world doesn't feel extremely safe right now for um, black women. So, uh, you know, Malcolm X talked about the fact that black women are the least protected in our society. So you now go to try to feel the full extent of these emotions. And then what happens? You, you get expelled, you get, you know, you, you lose your job and things like that. I feel like I have, I'm privileged in a certain respect because I have my own business. Like as, apart from, you know, being a creative and doing the things that I do, those things are possible because I have my own dance studio. So I don't have that fear that somebody's going to fire me for speaking my truth. But I understand that that is a very, very real fear for a lot of other people. Um, and I would say that it was around 2013, 2013, 2014, I really started to show up more um, 
as myself but that only came about because I kept meeting obstacles with people trying to shrink me people trying to contain me I often mention the story of um me reaching out to a dance studio in Manchester, a pole dance studio in Manchester that I wanted to come over and teach a twerk workshop because I see that they credited Miley Cyrus as being one of like the originators of twerk and that is a fake news. You know, it's, it's misinformation of the highest order. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, we were talking about twerk in the right way and crediting the right people. And they responded to me and said, oh, um, I don't enjoy your style of twerk. When me and my girls twerk, we put knee pads on and throw down and they didn't throw a single thing down. Um, so it, it, it was really, really a sad time to read that. But what I ended up doing was putting up a video of my class with their class and um, put that on Twitter. And I said, I've just received this response. I don't understand it. And lo and behold, everyone saw what I saw that nothing was happening there at all. And that created a lot of hassle for that dance studio, only for them to turn around and say that they were being bullied. But you sent a very unprofessional message to me when I offered my services. So, you know, that forced me to that ignorance forced me to show up. Like, I had to play my hand because of what I'd experienced. So that made me have to show up as more of myself. And I was rewarded, I guess, or supported for that um, because so many black women around the world, especially in America, because the story went viral. So many black women said to me, you know, you've got to open your own studio. This can't happen. This is unfair. You've got to open your own space. We'll support you. And that is where the idea kind of was that that seed was planted that I have to go and I have to do my own thing. Um, and that was, I would say that was around 2016. But before that, I'd been kind of facing these challenges where people would kind of come at me and I knew that it was a racialized, it was, a, a, you know, it was misogynoir. It was racialized and it was gendered and it was targeted at me and I had to respond in one way or another. And the only way I could respond was to show up as more of me. But I'm very careful to gauge how much I can show up as, you know, me, depending on the spaces that I find myself in, because some people are just so not well versed at having conversations about race at all that really if you try to explain what was happening and the dynamics that were taking place um they would be so lost that you would just end up in another kind of convoluted conversation and not much would get done therapy has helped me greatly taking myself to therapy around 2013 i would say was my saving grace because i ended up getting um, a black therapist before that I had like a white Italian therapist and I didn't really gel with her. Um, so I got a, um, a black therapist, Sarah, Sarah Ogole was my first therapist who kind of gave me the language for a lot of the trauma that I had experienced and a lot of the dynamics that were taking place and also challenged my views about things that I were, that I was kind of catastrophizing and preempting that hadn't actually taken place yet. So from then, I think that I really started to blossom. I really started to kind of um, become self-actualized and that happens in, you know, a number of ways. And it's not nice, it's, I'm not gonna romanticize it. It's messy, it's painful, it's a lot of things. But what I discovered in that process was, hey, yes, I am angry. I am angry and I have every right to be because my God, at that point I was only what, 20 something and so much has happened to me. How did, how did I make it this far? How did I make it this far where everyone was coming at me left, right and centre, yet yeah, I'm still here, like, you know, um, like Maya Angelou said, like, still I rise. And so I've got to, you know, I've, I've, I've got to show up as me. I've got no choice but to show up as me because everyone else wants me to not, you know, to not show up as myself. Thank you. Yeah, that was a really just amazing answer to the question. I feel like I've got so many, but someone has did ask. KD asked, um, there just seems to be a lot of, you know, fragility about talking about race in the UK. I mean, I was mm -hmm. going to ask you that question as well. Like, how have you, how have you, over, how have you overcome that? Because obviously your, like your first, your intro was talking about how white supremacy is literally, you know, embedded into everything that we do. And as, you know, an activist, it's really hard to tell people that because they just, they just don't want to understand. And obviously I get really burnt out and really annoyed about it, but obviously for someone who's been doing it for a lot longer than me, um, yeah, how does it make you feel like you just don't to the same to answer all these questions about why the UK is racist? 
Um, it is frustrating. I've got to agree. Like, it's so frustrating. So I commend you, Tasha, for, you know, doing the work that you do and, and especially, you know, speaking out in spaces that you're in as well, because there's a lot of gaslighting that takes place as well. But people are like, what do you mean racism? You're still alive. Like David Starkey literally told us that slavery and colonization, that they were not, that was not genocide, because why are there still so many damn blacks? He said, why are there still so many damn blacks as if we're ants, as if we're cockroaches? You know, he, that he was very annoyed that we still exist. And, and that sparked a national debate as to why that sentence was racist, like why that se sentence was so violent and so problematic. A lot of people failed to see it. Then we look at something like the diversity dance group performance on, is it Britain's Got Talent? And the amount of um, complaints that came through to Ofcom and people, oh, we just don't need that on our screens. I just don't want my children seeing that. That happened in America. Why are we making a big deal of it over here? What that teaches us is two things. One, just as Toni Morrison said, the very real function of racism is distraction. The, the amount of time that I spend arguing with you about whether something is racist or not, I could be moisturizing my scalp. I could be creaming my hands. I could be seasoning my food. I could be doing a number of things that benefit me as the individual that helps me to thrive. But I'm not doing those things because I've got to sit here and explain something to you that you are committed to misunderstanding. Like you have no desire to actually understand where I'm coming from. So that in and of itself is a power play. That is white supremacy at work. Secondly, I look at that and I think when I mention white supremacy, it has been very, very deliberate, the miseducation of the British public. It has been very, very deliberate, the miseducation of the white American, for instance. That didn't come by chance. You have to ask yourself why so many documents were destroyed um, when uh, a lot of countries were finally getting their independence, when the slave trade uh, ended. You've got to ask yourself why so many documents were dis um, you know, destroyed because it would have proven the true atrocity, the extent of the atrocities that took place during those centuries. It would, it would give us a very, very strong basis for reparations and a number of other um, acts to balance out and make equitable our society. Those things were destroyed and therefore also left out of the curriculum. We're not taught in the, um, you know, the national curriculum about the extent of Britain's um, involvement in so many um, destructive practices globally. We're not taught those things. So the average um, white British person is usually unaware of what they are complicit in. So when you go to have these conversations about race and racism, you've got to think that you're probably on, let's say, um, I don't want to say 100% understanding because we're always still learning. So let's say like we're all on 60, like some of us are on 60. You're dealing with people who are on minus 100 in terms of understanding of what's happening. So how are we going to leverage that? The conversation is going to be so infantile. And then on top of that, we know that people have been socialized, have been indoctrinated to believe in their inherent superiority because of their whiteness, because of their Britishness, because of their Americanness, right? So then they won't feel a need to listen to you really, because why should I? You're making all of these things up. These things didn't really happen. Or oh, it happened so long ago. Why are you going on about it now? We see it with the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement um, because of the killing of George, of George Floyd. But I, you know, we should also remember, you know, Breonna Taylor and in the UK, Sarah Reid, Mark Duggan, Smiley Culture, you know, Sheku Bayou. That's so many people that we have um, as a nation ignored over here because due to the exceptionalism of America, we can focus on what happens there because it gets more media coverage, right? So we're looking at all of these things and we're seeing lots of black squares and people going, lots of organizations and corporations saying, oh, we're going to unlearn. We're going to take our time to learn. Oh my God, racism is a thing. Racism's back. Racism, racism never left, you know? So that was interesting to me to literally watch because of the pandemic watch a lot of this country reckon with racism and the only thing that people could do were these um 
performances of like taking a knee or posting a black square. People are allowed to go outside again. People think the pandemic is over. People think therefore Black Lives Matter is over and racism is therefore over. And then we're back to, okay, the government doesn't want to feed um, um, children during the school holidays. They don't want to take responsibility for the fact that they've wasted money on a fake test and trace app. You know, they don't want to take responsibility for all of these things. So the violence still came back. They weren't ever going to leave the violence. They just gave us performances like the entire time. So when we talk about fragility, we're talking about fragility of the average British person who was not taught these things and they were not taught these things deliberately. They were deliberately left out of the curriculum, right? But when we talk about the government and having these discussions about racist practices, that is not fragility, that is deliberate. That is the deliberate erasure of any complicity or any admittance to the violence that they continue to inflict globally. Amazing. Yeah, just, yeah, for everyone, I was just going to say, it's really like amazing just to hear you speak because um, you just speak with such passion and such certainty. And it's really like inspiring to know that like black women are able to use their voices in this way without being, you know, scared of repercussions or anything like that. And I just feel like I'm relating to pretty much like everything that you've said. Like, I just, I'm like always like arguing with myself, like not to argue or whether to argue. So like, I don't know if Jake was going to jump in with a question because I feel like I'm asking so many. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dora, I was going to, I've got a question from Jamal, Dora. I'm, I'm, it's one sec. All the questions I've prepared are really wordy. So Dora, I'll ask this one real quick for <laughs> Jamal. Um, black women do so much to support and protect black men and yet still have the image of angry black women from a large number of black men. And not that it's your responsibility as black women to change that view, but what do you think needs to be done for that to change? Question. That's an amazing question, Jamal. Um, I talk, talk about this often with um, one of my uh, favorite tarot practitioners, Leona Nicole Black. She actually literally put out a video that's public that um, she did a live um, stream yesterday and it's public on YouTube if, um, YouTube if you want to watch it, Leona Nicole Black. Um, and she talks about what it means during this time of end SARS and, you know, all of these global um, uprisings, what it means for black people to be able to navigate in these spaces and like, what are our ancestors doing watching all of this stuff play out? And it's a very, very interesting um, reading that she does. I bring that up because she also talks about healing and how black love is part of the healing that is needed in order for us to um, transcend this time that we all find ourselves in. Um, black men have a lot of healing to do black men have we all have healing to do but i feel like black men specifically have a lot of healing to do because of the disproportionate physical violence and the mental violence that they face from the state yeah so when we look at the disproportionate stop and search rates which is something that i brought up to sadiq khan um, when i was doing another panel um when i attended another panel that he was on it was a panel about black lives matter and there was no dark-skinned black women there but that's the story for another day um, so I asked him this question, like how he can say that he wants to do better by um, black people in, in London specifically, when we know that you're asking for more police on the street and we know that police disproportionately stop and search black men and boys. And we know that they use disproportionate force on black men and boys. And then we also know that black men and boys are overrepresented in the prison system. And usually when we look at the de um, demographic of the black men and boys that are overrepresented in the uh, prison system, we also find that usually um, there's um, neurodiverse um, people there. We find that um, they have learning, you know, generally they have learning differences. So how is it that you've misconstrued learning differences and neurodivergence, um, like you've misconstrued that as somebody who is violent? That means that we have to look at the school to prison pipeline because when you go to school, you've got teachers and I would do numerous um, workshops at schools. Um, I used to do it for um, a charity who would book me to go and um, they would raise, children in school would raise money. And as their reward, I would go into the schools and teach them dance routines so I was traveling all around London doing these um, dance workshops with them and often what I would notice is the way that teachers spoke to black children especially the black boys you're naughty even the way that they would drag them almost and I just thought is the teachers 
are the teachers aware that they're behaving these, uh, this way specifically towards the black children and not the white children? Are they aware that they're doing this? Usually not. But this is why Jane Elliott did her, um, you know, experiment, you know, the brown eyed, blue eyed project when she's looking at the um, racism that people don't want to be confronted with. And when she did it in Britain, I remember there was a teacher, a white woman who said that she's not racist. She's like, I'm not racist. I'm not racist. But I do remember a time when I was in the playground and a little black girl fell over and scraped her knee. And I must say that I was shocked to see that her flesh was pink underneath. And I thought, girl, what did you think her skin was, her flesh was going to be like? Under What were you, purple? What were you expecting? So if a teacher is shocked, a teacher is shocked that a black child can have pink flesh, what other biases do they have that they haven't and bother to interrogate. And I bring this up to say that these are the people that then teach children and then decide that this, ch this child is unable to learn. This child is troublesome. We see when, you know, they're sent to Peru, when they're sent to, um, when they, you know, usually kicked out of school and sent to another um, facility to go and learn. Instead, we see that there are a lot of black children who end up in those, um, in those establishments. And naturally, where else are they going from there? We're hoping that they go on to do great things, but we're finding that a lot of them are ending up within the prison system. That tells me that there is something at play that black men are still trying to find words for. And whenever we want to sit down and have community-led initiatives, government stops funding community-led in initiatives. Think of the, the amount of... Um, you know, community centers and things like that that have disappeared. So there are no more. I remember when I was growing up, we had like after school groups and all of these things. They don't really seem to exist anymore. And so where are the children going to go? But the government love to tell you about black on black crime. If you have been abusing a, a, a group of people for so long, they will internalize that violence and they'll turn the violence inwards. That's not to say that black on black crime is real because black on black crime is a myth. People commit crimes where they live. And we talk about black on black crime, we don't talk about white on white crime, white on the rest of the world crime, which is the largest ever in, in history. We don't talk about that, you know? So I say this because there has been so much violence inflicted on black people, inflicted on black men throughout the centuries, that who wouldn't want a break? And by the virtue of their maleness, they are afforded certain privileges that I guess that black women are not afforded because of being woman. Who wouldn't want a way out? So that's why we do find that, yes, sometimes you see that they, that, that energy, that disdain, that internalized anti-blackness is turned towards black women. And you will hear black men say things like, oh, black men and um, black women are angry. Why, are they, why is their hair like that? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? Before it used to aggravate me, it used to upset me, but all I see now are wounded people who need to find healing, those who do that. But there are black men who are setting up groups, who are setting up, you know, um, initiatives so black men can talk to each other because they understand that really the only way through this is through healing. So I, as a, I have to say that personally, as a black woman, I've turned my attention to just focusing on black women because I can't let somebody come and beat my head constantly while I'm trying to help them. And I see it play out on social media all the time. I say so many things and I do so many things to support and to amplify the um, struggles that black men face. And I'll be the first one that some of them will come and tweet about and be like, she's so angry. She hates men. She, again, it used to upset me. Now I just mute, block, and I keep going because that, again, is a distraction. That is a symptom of racism. So thus, it's a distraction. So I've just got to leave it where it is. Amazing. Yeah, thank you again. Um, does anyone else have any questions? We've just had one posted in the chat. Um, okay. So black educators and teachers are trying to work in the education system, which ignores their history but also working hard to be the voice of the staff meeting to point out racism in their discussion or to think about their own teaching practice. Do we start with a national curriculum and ensure POC are used in their teaching? Yes, I think that, um, you know, black educators slash teachers are our future. I follow a few um, black teachers who are absolutely amazing because I see how they're trying to incorporate um, 
books written by black women um, and black people generally, um, books written by black authors, they try to bring it into their, um, their classrooms. I've been booked um, by a number of black educators to come into their schools, come in and speak with their sixth form groups and come in to speak to their class because what they're finding is that even if I can't overtly change the curriculum right now because all of you are going to fight me what I'm going to do is just show you more black faces doing everyday things speaking to you about everyday things but normalizing having black people in your spaces which I think is um, you know brilliant there has to be subversive ways I think for us to go about um challenging the curriculum because explicitly saying this needs to change because all it's focused on is whiteness is going to rub people up the wrong way because they'll be like what the hell is wrong with that you know white is king that's how they'll see it so what we have to do is think about everyday things like where are you going on field trips where you know what are you exposing them to when it's time to watch films like if you have black history month as annoying as it is that you've only got the month you really need to in that month get everything get as much as you can into that month to recalibrate whatever it is that's being done um generally within the school system Sorry about that. Sorry, my mic. <laughs> um, so, uh, with that, um, I think what what uh, in a world where we're expecting to be contactable all the time, and people on social media often demand a response from people like yourself and people who have public platforms, you've talked at length about how you're not anyone's angry black woman to rent. Uh, how do you ensure that you that you set clear boundaries and protect your space? it's constant because people don't listen people don't like to listen when you've had um centuries of being used to uh, black women providing you you with you know emotional labor free emotional labor free physical labor for forever and ever you, when a black woman says to you no i'm not doing that i think it catches a lot of people off guard or they think oh she's talking about those people she's not saying she won't do it for me she'll do it for me i'm gonna go and ask um and some people don't even ask they'll just send it you know there's an anthology called this bridge called uh this bridge called my back by sherry moraga that you know it's a collection of essays by um uh, black feminists and i just find it really really interesting because it's like a lot of the things that i'm experiencing now as someone who's hyper visible within the online space they talk about even though social media wasn't around um, in those times it's just the um, entitlement that people feel towards black women that we are all enduring and just ready to be of service all of the time. And I, that's why I do have my boundaries in place and I have to consistently enforce those boundaries. And I've made it clear that if anyone sends me any unsolicited kind of email um, or DM rather, private message or tag me in a tweet or a post that's traumatic, then I'll just instantly block them. That That's the most that I can do. I can instantly block them. And I know that people usually send me messages from another page, like their burner account and go, you blocked me. What did I do? Go and read the frequently asked questions to find out what you did. You're now, you're just going to remain blocked, but it has to, you just, there, you, it can't be something that you discriminate where you go, oh, well, you know, this person seems lovely, so I won't block them. No, everybody gets blocked. Blocker, blocker, blocker. <laughs> one more question just before you have a closing statement yes so, um, i just want to know um what is your message to um young black women so those who are like coming up so 16 to 25 what would you say to them like what what is your message to them like my message to them is you deserve peace you deserve peace like you are you are enough and your enoughness makes you deserving of peace. Like, it's so important that black women, black young women know that, that struggle is not the default setting. Nobody on this earth has the right 
to demand of you that struggle should be something that you should just put up with and you should endure. You know, it's a narrative that I think that our mothers and our grandmothers and our aunties um, have kind of passed on to us because that is what they experienced and that was their way of making it through. And while we're grateful and we honor their experience and, and what they had to do for us to like literally be here, there comes a point where we have to say that we can't continue this cycle, this intergenerational cycle of struggle. A good woman struggles, a good woman endures all things in that case i'm a bad woman yeah i'm very bad i'm keep being the bad girl that i am you know like that is it we can't we we just um we have to understand that we're deserving of peace and this is something that i face myself now where i might have a day where i'm not booked to do anything and instead of resting i think to myself oh my god no i've got to be productive because you know my worth is inextricably linked to my um productivity is the lie that I've told myself and I and I've internalized I have to go against that and say no even when I'm doing nothing I'm still worthy of love even when I'm doing nothing I'm worthy of peace I am enough when I'm doing nothing because oftentimes especially when you see people like me if I take a break off social media it's like where is she why isn't she here talking about this and why is it heaven forbid something happens that I don't talk about then why doesn't she care about this why isn't she using her platform to do this I have to really make a point of not internalizing that and going oh well in that case let me start making videos and talking about that because I too am deserving of peace the energy that you used to write, where am I talking about this? You could have talked about it yourself. Those 280 characters could have talked about the thing instead of directing it at me. Um, and that's in different aspects of life, relationships, romantic relationships. You don't go into it just wanting to be this rehabilitation center for broken men or broken people. No, you, you have to enter from a place of wholeness and know that you're deserving of peace in your relationships and you are enough to be in the relationships that there's no part of you that needs to be made whole or complete by another person who will feed off your very essence and your light. That was again, yeah, again, amazing. Um, just don't want to take like hold you on for too much longer. Do you have time for mm -hmm. a couple more questions? Would that be okay? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. You sure? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. go on. Uh, one sec, let me read, get the chat up. Um, so, Hi Kalechi, this is from uh, Love Deep. Uh, hi Kalechi, thank you so much for sharing your story. A huge fan of yours here for Baby Girl Energy, exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> As a therapist, I was wondering what's your experience of therapy, uh, what your experience of therapy was like? Was it helpful in your healing process? And what was unhelpful? Um, yeah, thank you, Love Deep. I mentioned it earlier that therapy was an um, instrumental, was instrumental in my growth. It was instrumental in um, me finding my voice, just, you know, using my voice um, and speaking my truth. Uh, it really helped me to have black therapists because from when I had my first proper therapist, as I call her, Sarah, I then went on to have another therapist, Cheryl. And now um, I always talk um, on my podcast and um, on social media about um, Emma, Emma, who, um, Radway Bright, who uh, has a, her pages therapy button on Instagram and um, her website is ineedtherapy.co.uk. I talk often about Emma because and these therapists because they've played a massive role in giving me that safe space to explore what it means to be Kalechi before being black and being woman and then being British and then being Nigerian and then being a social media commentator and all of these things like they've given me space to um to na just kind of explore what all of these different identities mean for me and understand that the one that takes precedence all of the time is me Kalechi not any of the other identities I do not have to be beholden to them and so th for, that's why for me therapy is important and also to have a therapist that challenges me because sometimes I will say well I'm not doing this because people are this and she's like well have people been like that recently or is this a story that we're running from before because sometimes we can operate from a place of fear so that's what I found really helpful um the therapist the very first therapist that i had that i mentioned the white italian woman i just didn't gel with because i think that there was just a cultural um disconnect she you know i would be telling her something and she just would almost 
feel like she was second guessing me and like maybe I wasn't sure of what I was talking about and so in those kind of spaces you don't feel safe because my culture is also an important aspect of who I am and it's also an in, like intrinsic part of my trauma and I should be able to talk about those things like if I ever try to bring up race with her she'd be like oh I don't really think that that's a thing you know we just operate as humans so from a human perspective why was this happening so yeah i think those are the things that are unhelpful when you disregard people's cultures but we know that psychotherapy um, inherently is focused on the white male experience and that's why it's important for women of color for black women um, for black people generally um, for non-white people to come through in that space and also document our own experiences Thank you. That, that was amazing. Okay, so I think that was um, all of our questions for you. That okay. was, uh, thank you ever so much. Um, I just wonder if it was asked, uh, okay to ask about um, what's happening on Channel 4 this evening. <laughs> Channel 4 this evening is a documentary. Um, it's, a, it's a very short film. It's incredibly short. Five minute film about black motherhood. It's part of the Random Cuts Black History Month um, kind of uh, segment that Channel 4 is doing, I think it's an injustice that it's only four, uh, five minutes long, um, but we get to see different experiences of black mothers. And I'm one of the mothers that talk about my blackness and my motherhoodness, I guess. Amazing, yeah. That's, uh, well, I'm, well, I'll try and make sure we all tune in, I think I suggest everyone should. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you again for, everything you've come to say tonight has been really amazing i'm sure everyone else will say exactly the same yeah. thank you yeah thank you and um remember to listen to the say your mind podcast on all, <laughs> all streaming services yeah thank you ever so much for all the questions i'm sorry if we didn't get to uh cover all of them but we we had a good go at it i think yeah you did well thank you very much thank you for having me thank you take care